the board. Great. All right, just figured I'd make sure everyone gets those marks. Okay, so you all tried the practice test, right? I don't care if you got it right or wrong or whatever, we're gonna go through it, right? And so my hope is that what I say now will make a little bit more sense that you've attempted it and kind of been in there to see what's going on. You know what I need? I need the practice test. What? What the? It's not letting me open it. Try opening in another app. What on earth? Okay. That's right. We just can't do it. Luckily, I saved a copy. All right. So. Remember, assignment four is due uh, on Wednesday, November 14th, same day as test two. What? That's so much work. Don't worry. Assignment four is basically like a second practice test, right? So treat assignment four as a second practice test. Okay. Just like this. So it's uh, very short, right? But there's a lot of ins and outs and kind of a lot of new conceptual things that we have to deal with, right? And so um, that's why I, I wanna give you lots of time for the test, right? Uh, the downside is it's only 20 marks. What? I know. So uh, I will be marking uh, kindly, but also you need to be making sure that everything is done really, really carefully. Right? So, um, all right. Oh yeah, and no labs this week. I need you to remember that because I will not be there. It's a long weekend, I'm getting out of here. Okay, so. Practice test to solutions. And as always, I'll post my notes and you'll have the video to go back to, right? And I will draw some comparisons between the practice test and the assignment, right? Because I know that you won't have the assignment solutions back yet, right? But just treat it as another practice test you'll be good to go, right? Test two is really on just uh, 4.1 and 5.1, right? So, but it, a, lot, a lot happened in there, okay? So question one <coughs> says that West Indian manatees travel at a speed that's approximately normally distributed with a mean of 3.8 miles per hour and a standard deviation of 1.34 miles per hour. 
So I'm going to summarize that as the speeds follow a normal distribution with a mean of 3.8 and a standard deviation of 1.34. That's just so I don't have to write out the whole question. Right? That you don't have to synthesize the question like that at all. Right? I just don't want to write it all out. Okay. But that's what it's saying. Right? So the speeds follow a normal distribution with a mean of 3.8 and a standard deviation of 1.34. Right? On the assignment, right, a lab weighs filters from a coal mine to measure the amount of dust in the mine atmosphere. Seems reasonable enough. Repeated measurements of the weight of dust in the same filter vary normally with a mean of 123 and a standard deviation of 0.8. Right? So same idea. Now you've got the weights follow a normal distribution with a mean of 123 and a standard deviation of 0.8. Right? So far, so good. Right? So the beginning, they're set up the same way. Right? And so you can expect the beginning of question one on the test to be set up that same way as well. Right? Something follows a normal distribution right, with a mean of this and a standard deviation of that. Okay. So then part A, we want to know what speeds capture the central 90% of speeds of manatees. I guess I went species specific, but it doesn't matter. That was just for fun. Okay. If you read part A, and part D, those look fairly similar, right? If you read part D, what speeds capture the central 90% of mean speeds of West Indian manatees, right? So here, we're just talking about speeds, so not the average speeds, right? So what we've got here, right? No mention of means, of mean speed, right? So we have a, ooh, whoa. a single observation. If we only have one observation, right? Then we have, I guess I dipped into 3.1, right? So then we're going to use z equals x minus mu over sigma, right? Because this is a single observation. Right. So I'll start off with talking about just what's the probability associated with a single observation. Right. So we can we can figure this out, right? But then part B from part B onwards, right? I tell you, okay, now you've collected a sample, and now you're talking about the mean speed of this sample, right? So then we have to use the other version of Z, right? I'll make a little side note here. For mean observations, use Z equals X bar minus mu over sigma over root N. So if you see the word mean in there, right, and it, it's referring to the, the average, right, then you have to use this Z, the second Z, Z equals X bar minus mu, because you're talking about a mean, right? 
So let's actually answer this question. So what speeds capture the central 90% of speeds of manatees? So I want to see and I need to see a normal distribution. We're centered on 3.8 and sigma is 1.34. So then there's gonna be some lower bound and an upper bound where this area, right, the central 90%, so where this area is 0 0.90. We've got a, oh, does anyone need a copy of the table for today? Don't be shy. You brought them, everyone brought theirs. That's great. I don't buy it, but that's great. Let me know if you need one. Okay. So we've got a couple of ways to, to do this problem. I think the easiest way, right, is to look at the confidence level, right? Because what we know, right, is just kind of jotting it down. We can go from, from an X, to a z to some probability, right? A probability being an area under the curve, right? And vice versa. But if we have this observation, right, that we need, so we need to find this value and this value. So these are going to be values of x, which means we have to start over here. We have to know the area under the curve, right? And what the Z scores, right? What Z they correspond to in order to solve for X. Okay. So then we explain. Oh yeah, go for it. Yeah, feel better. Okay. So um, we have to find our Z scores that capture the central 90%, and then we can calculate our X, right, our axis. So we explain what we're doing. So using table C, like I said, there's a couple of different ways that you could do it, right? You could figure out the area in one of the tails and then find the Z star associated with that cutoff point. Right, that's fine. Or you can use the 90% confidence level, right? Which I'm going to do because I think it's easier. Just remembering that that's always the central percentage, right? When it goes from 50 to 99.9%. Right? And I'll always pick one of these values, right? I'm not going to go off the grid here. So using table C, <coughs> With a confidence level oops, of 90%, we find it corresponds to Z star equal to right. So I'm just explaining what I'm doing here. So I'm using the table and then a 90% confidence level, so 1.645, right? So Z star is gonna be plus minus 1.645. If you forgot the plus minus, that's okay. Um, but you would need the minus later on, right? So what that's saying is that between Z, right, of negative 1.645 and positive 1.645, We've got that central 90%. So we can find the lower bound You've got two formulas, right? We want to solve for x. I like to just use the z formula and ignore that x formula. Uh, but if you prefer to use the x formula right away, that's OK. They do the same thing. Z is X minus mu over sigma. 
So for the lower bound, right, Z is going to be negative 1.645, which is X. I'll put a little subscript L for lower so I can keep track of them. That's not necessary, but minus, I think we had 3.8. all over sigma, which is 1.34. So then we have 1.645 negative times 1.34. So negative 2.2043 is x lower minus 3.8. Add 3.8 to both sides. I have a lower bound of 1.5957. And just so I can have, have it kind of on the same screen, I'll do the upper bound here. Z is x minus mu over sigma. Now we need that positive Z, right? 1.645 is x upper minus 3.8 over 1.34. Oops. One point six four five times three point or sorry, one one point six four five times one point three four should be the same. 1.645 times 1.34. There we go. 2.2043. Right. I knew I did it wrong because they should be the same, just positive and negative. Right. And then when we add the 3.8, that's when they change. Upper minus 3.8. So x on the upper bound plus 3.8. Oops. 6.0043. You can write a blurb if you want to, but really all I'll be looking for is this lower and upper bound. Therefore, the central 90% of manatees travel at speeds between one point, uh, let's say six zero, rounding to two decimal places, let's do miles per hour and 6.00 miles per hour, bless you. Nice. Any questions about that one? For the 1.34? Because we want to move the 1.3 over, right? So we have to multiply. Because it's dividing on the right-hand side, we have to multiply on both sides to get rid of it. It's illegal math. If it's multiplying, then you would divide both sides. Right? You could technically multiply or divide by 1 over 1.34. But Yeah. So we need to find our Z, right, in order to, to calculate our X, right? And so we need to explain how we're going to find, um, find our Z. So what might be tempting, and I, I understand what you're doing, right? But when I see stuff like 
90% equals 1.645. I have to take marks off, right? Because that's, there's no universe where that's true. And I see that all the time, right? And I know what you're thinking, right? But what you're saying is false, right? And so this is false. And so to avoid that kind of error, I have to dock you marks because you're actually telling me something that's not true, right? The only way to really do that is just to explain what we're doing, right? Because we know that the 90% confidence level, right? That gives us the central 90%, right? And then, so if we go down, then we find that 90% corresponds to a Z star of 1.645, and that's what we want. Does that make Sense. Oh, so um, if we had the Z distribution, right, which is centered on zero, right, so then those cutoff points would be at negative 1.645 okay. and 1. Cool. Nice. All right. Okay. Great. Any other questions before we? Yeah. I have a question. The way that I set it up here, without writing the document, I should have to equate to it's going to the same. I would have to take marks off there. So we got to nip that in the bud. If I see, <laughs> that'll get your attention. If I see stuff like this, right? Were you telling me, uh, where you're telling me that two things are equal, that in fact are not equal, right? I want you to be very careful using your equal signs, right? Because in math and stats, right, equal signs, they mean something, right? And so this is not equal to this in any universe, right? And so I, I can't have you writing that. It's embarrassing. <laughs> no, but uh, right. So I need to drive that home because I see that all the time. Right. I think it's worth the uh, twenty percent of your grade. Yes. Yeah. So for for both of the tests, right? If you do better on the final, then I'll just put the weight of that whichever test you did worse on, onto the final, right? So as long as you feel like, because I know if things are going on, it's a busy term and it's that time of year, right? Midterm season. So things happen, people have bad tests, but typically I make this one weighted high because it's usually a really good test for everyone. So, but now I've said that, so who knows? All right, I gotta stop being a chatty Kathy. Part B, so moving on, okay. Part B on the test, right? And part B on the assignment, I tell you, okay, now you collect a, a random sample of sample size 50 for the practice test, just sample size three for the assignment, What's the distribution of this mean, or what is the sampling distribution of their average speed x bar? Okay. So I'll just say, uh, if n equals 50, right? So I tell you, okay, you've calculated your, this is my shorthand version of the question, right? If you collect a random sample of 50, find sampling distribution of x bar. That's on your formula sheet, right? In section 4.1, right? So x bar follows a normal distribution with a mean mu and a standard deviation of sigma over root n, right? So all I'm looking he for here is x bar follows a normal distribution with mean mu and a standard deviation sigma over root n, right? 
or in our case, right, if you jumped straight to this, that would be fine. X bar follows a normal distribution with a mean of 3.8 and a standard deviation of 1.34 over the square root of 50. That's all you have to write. This here is all you have to write for one mark. That's pretty good. Yeah. yeah. So this is the sampling distribution of X bar. Right? X bar follows a normal distribution with a mean of 3.8 and a standard deviation of whatever, 1.34 over root 50. Okay. If you simplified your 1.34 over root 50, that's fine. I'm just going to leave it. So that one, one mark in the bag. Part B, you could even jump straight to it if you wanted to on the test for a quick win. And what is the probability, so part C, what is the probability that the mean speed of your sample is less than 3.4 miles per hour? So probability that the mean speed is less than 3.4 miles per hour. It's kind of there's none like this one on the assignment. I just go straight to the last part, right? So on the assignment, it's a little bit shorter. I wanted to keep it to one page, that's why. Okay. So we've got a mean speed here. This means that we have to use Z equals X bar minus mu over S or sigma over root N. So we use the T's. Because okay. the mean is your X bar. Right. So that's gonna be the difference between these questions. You have a single observation, and then I tell you, okay, now you collect a sample. Here's your sample size. Now let's talk about the mean, right? What's the probability of the means now? Okay. So in terms of the normal distribution, right? We still know that X bar follows a normal distribution with a mean of 3.8 and a standard error of 1.34 over the square root of 50. Right. Sigma is still 1.34, but in terms of the spread, right, we have the standard error. And so 3.4 miles per hour would be somewhere down here. Right. And we want the area that's less than 3.4. So we want to know, right? If I want a probability, I'm going to be finding an area in the tail, right? Or an area under the curve. So this is the area that I want. To do that, right? I need to take my 3.4, convert it to a Z score, right? And then I can use the table to figure out my approximate probabilities. So Z equals X bar minus, oops, minus mu over sigma over root N. So 3.4, that's the one we want to, that's the mean that we're concerned with, right? 3.4, that's our X bar. Right? So notice, right, because a lot of the time I see these guys mixed up. 
but whatever is in the center, right, that's just holding steady, that's your mu. And then the value that you're interested in, that's the one that goes in the x or in the x bar. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what was that? So, oh, so sigma over root n is a bit of a mouthful. So it's just called the standard error. Okay. I'll make a little note. Nice. Cool. So how far is a mean of 3.4 from 3.8, taking into account that sigma over root n or the standard error? So 1.34 over the square root of 50. <laughs> uh, because uh, it's the value that we're interested in. Right, so whichever one that's, that's kind of moving around depending on the question, that's going to be the value that goes here, whether it's x or x bar. And the 3.8, it's just holding steady, so it's your mu. Yes. Because, right, if you switch these around, you'll get the same value, but it would be positive instead of negative. Right? So... Conceptually, it matters. Uh, applied, it doesn't, right? Because then we use our table and we drop the negative regardless, right? So you would still get the answer, but uh, the thinking is off. Because okay. this, if we're in the lower tail, our Z would be negative. So you want to be careful with that. Okay, 50 square rooted, one over that times 1.34. So you can make sure that you get the right thing on your calculator. I get 1.34 over the square root of 50 is 0.189504613. Three point four minus three point eight negative point four over point one eight nine five zero four six one seven divided by I get five point sorry I dropped the negative negative five point two seven six nine one six two seven eight. So Z is roughly negative five point two seven seven to three decimal places. Right, you have to have at least three decimal places. <coughs> yeah. Oh, uh, just on my calculator, I did when I redid it. Because it's negative 0.4 over positive 0.189. It's, I lost it on my calculator. So it's all there. But I accidentally did just 0.4 divided by. Oh, really? Maybe I dropped more than, uh, more than I thought. Look at you guys go. Yeah. Crisis averted. How about, do I have any takers for negative 2.1107? Six six five one one. <laughs> Second time's the charm. So Z is roughly negative two point 
one, one, one to three decimal places, right? You have to have three decimal places because the table gives you three decimal places. So you want to be at least as accurate as the table, right? So now, right, we can find this area in the tail, right? That's going to be our one-sided P. Yes, at least at least three. Oh yeah, yeah, that's good. So again, so we avoid any false statements, right? You're gonna just explain what you're doing. So using table C, oops. We find, and then I use the same setup always, and I recommend you do the same. The absolute value of Z equal to negative 2.111, is between two values. So we take, we drop our negative. 2.111 is going to be between 2.054 and 2.326. Yes. Yeah. So because we're calculating a Z, we should use uh, the Z star line. Okay. Um, if in doubt, right, if you're not sure if you should use the Z or the T, I would prefer that you use the T as a default, right? Um, because it's going to be what we use throughout. Yes. Yeah, probably because it's a big enough sample size. But, okay. but because we calculated a Z here, we're going to use the Z star line. Okay. So our one-sided P is between two values, reading them from right to left, right, to make sure that they're increasing. 0.01 to 0.02. Bless you. Therefore, the probability that the mean speed is less than, therefore, the probability that the mean speed is less than 3.4 miles per hour is somewhere between 0.01 and 0.02, right? So because we calculated a Z up here, right, we should be using the Z star line. then, yeah, then to be consistent, then you would have to use your degrees of freedom. Technically, you should be calculating Zs here, right? But if you ended up calculating Ts, that's a better error than calculating Zs when you should be doing Ts. So I choose my battles, right? So if you did Ts here, that's okay. It's not 100%, but it's okay. So, all right, where are we here? Part D. What speeds capture the central 90% of mean speeds? Oh. 
we do the same thing that we did in part A, right, just with the mean speeds, right, we still, we have to use z equals x minus mu over sigma over root n, right, instead of z equals x minus mu over sigma, right. But the idea stays the same. Still centered on 3.8, and the standard error is 1.34 over the square root of 50. And we want to find the means that capture the central 90%. And if you look at your assignment, what two weights capture the central 95% of mean weights? So, um, same thing, right? But you're gonna react to the word mean in there, right? Because now you have a sample size of three from part B. So, using table C, we're going to find our Z star, right, the same way that we did for a single observation, right? So these critical values, as they're called, they, they don't care if you have a mean or a single observation, right? So using table C with a confidence level of 90%, we find it corresponds to Z star equal to plus minus 1.645. Same idea. I'm going to find the lower bound. So Z equals X bar minus mu over sigma over root N now. So for my lower bound, I've got a negative 1.645 equals X bar lower that I'm trying to find minus 3.8 over 1.34 over the square root of 50. Uh, 1.645 times <coughs> negative 0.311. Seven three five zero nine six is x bar minus three point eight. So x bar lower, I get three point four eight eight two six four nine zero four. the confidence interval. Yeah, but instead of sigma, you'll have to use sigma over root n. You can. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Yeah, so if you want to use the same equation for x, but replace it with x bar, then you'd have to repl replace your sigma with sigma over root n. <coughs> Okay, so how about our upper bound? Z equals x bar minus mu over sigma over root n. One point six four five. We need the positive one now, right? 
x bar up or minus 3.8 over 1.34 over the square root of 50. 1.645 times. Point three one one seven three five zero nine six. This bar upper. So I've cheated and I've stored the sigma over root n on here, right? So and your calculator probably has a storage function. So if you want to want me to have a look at that, we can right get that figured out because it's going to come in handy. And then plus three point eight. So I get x bar upper is 4.111735096. Therefore, the central 90% of mean speeds is between 3.49 miles per hour and 4.11 miles per hour. So there's three ones. Yeah. You can. Yeah. Yes. It would be. We haven't looked at that one, right? But um, it would be. Did you keep all your decimal places? Might be something like that lurking. Yeah. Just check. Yeah, if you keep all your decimal places, you should get the, the exact same thing. Yeah. Cool. Nice. And now I encourage you to look at the difference between the central 90% of a single observation versus a mean observation, right? Mean observations are way closer together than a single observation. But we are, we got to keep moving here. Question two. It's kind of the new stuff, but uh, I'm, I was happy to hear that it was kind of the, the good part of the questions so it's good so an insurance company is reviewing its current policy rates seems reasonable enough when originally setting the rates they believed that the average claim amount was eighteen hundred dollars or one thousand eight hundred they're concerned that the true mean is actually higher than this it's because they could potentially lose a lot of money obviously right they're saying oh yeah the average claim amount is one thousand eight hundred but if they're constantly getting claims higher than that, that's bad news bears. So to test it, right, they randomly select 40 claims. So we have a sample size of 40 and calculate a sample mean of 1,950. 1,950 is more than 1,800, right? We want to know if it's significantly more, right? Or is it within that kind of wiggle room realm? with a standard deviation of $500. Okay. So part A, okay. should the insurance company be concerned? They're concerned if the mean is actually higher than 1800, right? Uh, the insurance company will be concerned If the mean is higher than 1,800, right? So that's kind of our takeaway message. Okay. So we'll use a hypothesis test with an alpha level of 0.01, right? I'll just make a little note here. Alpha level is 0.01. If I don't give you an alpha level, right, the default you use 0.05. Okay. So step one to answer the question, right? We have to state our hypothesis. Okay. 
we've only seen one type of hypothesis, right? 5.1. So it's for uh, one sample mean. We've collected one sample of uh, claims, calculated their mean. That's all we've got. So we've got one sample mean. And on your formula sheet, right, you have H naught. And I want to see colons after the H naught because this is a statement, right? Here comes my null hypothesis. Okay. That mu is 1,800. Because okay. the setup of these questions is that, yeah, you've collected some sample information, but you want to compare it to some value, right? And that value goes in your hypothesis. Yeah. How can H not also be less than um, Yes. But yes, yeah, as long as it's equal to, but I want you to be careful, I would just stick to the equal to, right? But yeah, that's true. Yeah. All right, so sample information, we want to compare it to some value. That value is what goes in your hypothesis. Okay. Our alternative hypothesis. Our null hypothesis always has just an equal sign in it. Okay. Our alternative hypothesis has the same values here and here. Right? The only thing that's going to change is the sign here. By default, so if you're not sure, you're going to use a not equal to. Right? If you read the question and you're saying, oh shoot, I don't know which one to use here. I want you to use the not equal to, right? That's what's on your formula sheet. But because here, we want to know if the mean is higher, right? More than 1800, right? So then we want to know if mu is greater than 1800. Okay. So by default, if you're not sure, right? Use a two-sided test, meaning use the not equal to, right? But because this question specifies, right, the mean is higher than 1,800, right? That's what makes this a one-sided test, right? Because, and that means that we'll need a one-sided p-value later on, right? Because I'm only concerned with one extreme, right? Mu being greater than 1,800. Okay. So one-sided test. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, if I said uh, the insurance company would be concerned if the mean is not eighteen hundred, right? So if it's different from eighteen hundred, regardless of which direction, then you would have a two-sided test because you would have to have that not equal to in your alternative hypothesis. That makes sense? So it's from the question, yeah. Let's do it. Any questions about this before we do that, though? Yeah, yeah so you want to be careful, right? You never want to put your sample mean here because we collected our sample in order to compare it to something, right? If you think about how you would approach a research problem, right, you have some theory, right? That theory is that the mean might be higher than 1800, we're kind of worried, right? And so that theory is what goes here. Then we collect a sample to try to figure out what's actually happening, right? So, Step two, and you don't have to outline the steps. I just like to do it for all of these hypothesis testing questions because then you'll start to see, oh, they're all the same. How boring. No, I know it's not boring. I know it's hard, but you'll be hypothesis testing machines in no time. Guarantee it. And then I'd have like a, a quick, blah, 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 blah. Please talk to your doctor. Guaranteed. Yeah, or your money back. No. 
Actually, I wouldn't care. I'd do this for free. So, in terms of our normal distribution, right, just to have a look at what's happening, our null hypothesis is that mu equals 1800. And so the key with this testing is that we assume that the null hypothesis is true until we have proof otherwise, right? And so if the null hypothesis is true, then mu must be equal to 1800. And we have uh, where did I? Oh, it's because I didn't write it down. We're given the x bar, the sample mean, right, 1950. S was 500, right? The sample standard deviation is S. And N, we collected a sample of 40 claims. So we want to know how far is 1950, how far above 1800 is it? Right. And then to quantify it, we find our one-sided p-value. Oops, what happened there? So do the test. You don't have to show the graph or anything, right? Doing the test just means calculate t equals x bar minus mu over s over root n. Notice on your formula sheet, right, in section 5.1, it starts with your null and alternative hypothesis, and then it goes and shows you how to calculate t. That's the step that you're going to do in step two, do the test, calculate the t. So then we've got t is x bar, which is 1950, minus mu, which is 1800, over s, which is 500, over the square root of 40. So we've got 40 square rooted, one over that times 500. And I'm going to store that. So I get 1950, or maybe I'll, that's 150, right? Divided by 79.0569415. Right, so just make sure that you get the same answer. And that's where the store function comes in handy, right? Because now I've just stored this in a little slot on my calculator. And like I said, I'm happy to show you how to do it on your calculator because I'm confident that it does it. So 1950 minus 1800 divided by that guy, I get a T of 1.897366596. So T is to three decimal places, at least three decimal places, 1.897 to three decimal places. So we know now that 1.9 or 1950 is 1.897 standard errors above 1800. So it's a little bit far away. Right, let's figure out if we can reject the null hypothesis or not using our p-value. Step three, find the p-value. To find our p-value, right, we have to use table C. So using table C with and because we've calculated a t, we have to have our degrees of freedom. Degrees of freedom equal to n minus 1, which is 40 minus 1, which is 39. Try to go to 39. There is none. 
we might be tempted to go to 40, but we can't because we only have a sample size of 40, right? not 41. So we have to go all the way down to 30 degrees of freedom, right? You go down to the closest value. So must use degrees of freedom equal to 30. So if the exact line that you're looking for isn't there, then you have to go down one. We find, and now the same setup that we did for those probabilities with the z-score, we find that the absolute value of t equal to 1.897 is between, so 1.897 for 30 degrees of freedom. And I like to take something, just kind of make sure I stay on the right line. 1.897 is between 1.697 and 2.042. So now we have to decide if we want a one-sided or a two-sided P. We have a one-sided test, so we need a one-sided P. So our one-sided P is between, oh, I lost it, 0 0.025 and 0 0.05. Now for the moneymaker, the conclusion. Step four is our conclusion. First, we have to compare, how does our p-value compare to our alpha level? Remember, I told you the alpha level is 0 0.01, right? This range is not less than 0 0.01, right? So we explain, since our one-sided p-value is between 0.025 and 0.05, it is not less than our alpha level of 0.01. Right? Which means, now we have to state what that means in terms of the null hypothesis which means we don't have enough evidence to reject H0, which, which means we do not have enough evidence to reject H0. Right. Which is nice, right? Because what does that mean in, for the insurance company? They've got nothing to worry about, right? Borderline, it's a little bit high, right? But maybe if they took another sample, it'd be closer to the 1800. Therefore, the insurance company does not need to worry. I'll show off a little bit about the mean claim being higher than higher than 1800. You don't have to throw that last part in. But tests are all about showing off everything that you know. So with minutes to spare, I'll head straight into the confidence interval, right? We're gonna answer this exact same question now using, use a 98% confidence interval. First thing we have to do, right, is find our T star, right? So our confidence intervals on our formula sheet, right? 
And so we know X bar, we know S and we know N. We just have to find T star before we can get started, right? So confidence intervals are kind of everyone's favorite thing after a long hypothesis test, long day at the office. So we have to explain how we get this T star. And that's the same way as we got the Z star for finding the central 90% that we've been doing. Here we just want 98%, right? So using table C with a confidence level of 98%, oops, And because we want a T, we have to use our degrees of freedom. And degrees of freedom equal to N minus one, which is still 40 minus one, which is 39, but we have to use degrees of freedom equal to 30. Like I said, may as well show off again that you know how to find your degrees of freedom. Uh, so using table C with a confidence level of 98% and 30 degrees of freedom, uh, we find that T star is, so we have 30 degrees of freedom. So I'm going to put my paper down there so to make sure I stop at 30 degrees of freedom. And then 98 takes me to a T star of 2.457. So now I can build my confidence interval X bar plus minus T star times S over root N. X bar was 1950 plus minus T star, which is 2.457 times S, which was 500 over the square root of 40. I've saved my 500 times, or over the square root of 40, times 2.457 in the interest of time here. 194.5. I'll store that. 1950. We report our answers in round brackets, lower bound separated by a comma than upper bound. So 1950 minus that 194, I get 1755.757095 up to 1950 plus that upper or the 194, up to 2144.242905. If you recognize that this is money right away, then sure, just go to two decimal places. Right. If not, I don't know, why not just throw them all in there? We have to interpret this and then use it to answer the question, right? But the interpretation is the same for all these confidence intervals. So we are 90% confident, keep messing up my 98, 98% confident that the interval from 170 or 1,755 and 76 pennies to 2,144 and 24 pennies captures the mean claim amount. Now, in terms of the question, right, since 1800 is in this realm, then they don't have to be worried. If this entire interval was above 1800, then they would be worried, right? Because we're 90%, 98% confident that it's somewhere in there, right? So since 1800 is 
within this interval, the insurance company does not need to worry. And if you have a look at question two on uh, the assignment, right, you're going to do a hypothesis test and then answer the question with a confidence interval. Okay. If you have questions, let me know. Otherwise, I'll see you on uh, Wednesday. Here. Have a good long weekend. Oh, I'll come back. I'm just going to stop this.